Okay, we are live. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Somers Town Board Work Session starting here at 7.05 for Thursday, April 11th, uh, 2024. Uh, before we uh, we start uh, and go into our public comment, um, Patty, we're going to take off <clears throat> number five, and we're going to just some uh, do our due diligence on this and uh, postpone it for um, – either next week or just week. read it what it is. Uh. And number five is a uh, schedule of public hearing for the proposed local law to rescind article seven entitled heritage Hills section one, five, eight, one, five, eight dash 23 B uh, stop intersections located on the West Hill for the proposed three-way stop sign at West Ridge drive and Hill drive and the three-way stop sign at West Ridge drive and Waterview drive. Uh, and that was going to be on May 9th, but we're taking that off uh, for the public hearing for that day. Um, that brings me to the public comment. I would like to make a motion to open a public comment. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Is anybody here for public comment? Uh, Mr. Surprise, I'm going to make one quick comment. Yes, please. For that, I just want to say, and I'm sorry, it'll be very quick. I made it to some people here when I went, walked in and started putting some chairs out. I understand what most of the comments are going to be about, but just to lay the groundwork for future also. I am looking forward to listening to your comments. Unfortunately, I have to recuse myself from this subject based on my, my employment. Um, but I, I understand where all of you are coming from, and uh, and I look forward to, to hearing your. And the other thing is, you're going to have three minutes. I mean, we're going to you got a lot of people here. We're going to listen to what you say and maybe make some comments at. The, but let's not do a crazy, uh, you know, interactive. Uh, we are going to let session. you speak, though. We're going to let you speak. Yeah, we'll let, let you speak. So we saw what happened. Uh, somebody did try to do. We'll let you guys. Speak. <laughs> you can say pretty much anything you like within bounds. Yeah. yeah. We got chairs up here. So when you please, when you come up to the podium, please just give me your your name and address. Uh, if you're from Somers or Carmel, that is uh, that is okay. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, right to right to Patty, please. Thank you. Hand them out to the board members and the attorney. <laughs> My name is Roland Seafrone. I live at Nine Lounsbury Drive. I'm sure you've heard my last name before. Um, and I'm, I'm here to address uh, some of my comments, and I will start a prepared statement. You can follow along. Good evening, Mr. Scarano and the Somers Town Board members. I came here tonight to speak to you. Thanks, Mr. Scarano, for composing the letter of opposition to the Formal Town Planning Board and the proposed about the proposed lithium and battery storage industrial facility as well as our county, state, and federal representatives. For those that do not know, this proposed 160 megawatt monstrous battery storage facility will take up six to eight acres and is situated 200 feet from our backyards on Lounsbury Drive. This is supposed to be the largest megawatt storage facility in the country or very close to it. The property in total is about 95 acres of which 45 are soaking wet. The swamps and wetlands are delineated on grid markers that the DEC has set up. Also, there are PVC pipes in the ground to show water elevations. There are test pits that were dug many years ago, I know maybe 25 years ago, that never drain away. The water table just sits about, about what the grade of the land is, and the swamp area is up to a foot or two deep. <clears throat> We know that this water feeds our aquifers and runs off to the stream along Route 118, Lake Shanarock, and then to the Amawak Reservoir. On the other side of the property, the said property, Union Valley Roadside, the water drains towards Lake Lincolndale and then ultimately to the Musket Reservoir. In the event that a fire occurs, and it will happen, <clears throat> just a matter of time, if water is used as a cooling agent for fire suppression and these chemicals runoffs get into the groundwater, <clears throat> we will once again have contam a contamination problem in Baldwin Place. We know about that because that contamination has gone on for over 40 years. I drank contaminated water once down in Camp Lejeune, 1970, in boot camp <clears throat> uh, training. I never want to drink that again. One of my friends that enlisted with me in 1970 recently died from Lou Gehrig's disease that was directly attributed to his water contamination exposures that we were all exposed to. <clears throat> we don't want this to happen again. As far as the smoke that will billow out from the out of control for four days or two weeks, whatever it takes, before the thermal runaway fire has burned itself out, the present answer is to shelter in place. Well, this is not an acceptable answer to a preventable occurrence. After the 9-11 attack, our government told 
the rescue and recovery workers, the air was okay to breathe. Well, we know how that turned out. More recovery workers have died from breathing that than the 9-11 attack victims. One of my neighbors on Cornelius, who was there, he suffers from three different cancers right now attributable, attributable to the air is okay to breathe. Also, of course, our primary concern is for the children and toddlers that we have so many of in our neighborhood. How do you tell a child in primary school to shelter in place and uh, what you breathe may someday kill you? Now, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I bought my acre in 1980 and built my house in 83 on Lounsbury Drive. Mitch Miller owned the property behind me then. And <laughs> this, you don't see this on here, but when I did my due diligence buying the acre, I talked to Mitch Miller when he was building Greenbrier over here. And he told me at that time he wanted to build condos and uh, townhouses, residential. And somehow something else has developed. I don't know how that changed. So I am a retired master electrician that has had the good fortune to work residential, commercial, industrial, nuclear generation, fossil fuel generation, substation construction, transmission construction, and distribution systems for NIPA, Entergy, and Con Edison. I know what I'm talking about when I look at this project. This location is being built as the perfect place to build a facility, as it is out of sight. Well, that out of sight is only to Carmel residents, not being seen from Miller Road or Union Valley Road, because it is so far inland that either road is directly behind our houses. I invite you to view this industrial complex from my backyard. It's a clear shot. You can see every part, every part of it where they already put the cuts in the, with their, uh, their machines. I know of at least one more location in, Carmel, in the Carmel jurisdiction that would make more sense to put this and be more accessible than behind our houses. I know about the 132 KB feeder runs. I will discuss these lo like locations at an appropriate time. Also, it should be noted that we do not want to hear the constant hum of 132 KV transformer to be placed behind our houses. I'm sure that the, for the above mentioned reasons, none of you would ever want to have this behind your house. Finally, this is a self in wound caused by King Andy shutting down Indian Point. It would appear that these instantaneous and not yet proven forms of green energy will continue on. That being said, I would encourage the board to immediately create a moratorium against these monstrosities in the town of Somers. So nobody else has to endure the anxiety that we face every day with the thought of an undetermined amount of loss of values to our homes and modify the master plan to reflect this. If you do this, I'll tell you what, I'll volunteer to be part of any advisory committee to help you do this. And I again want to thank Mr. Scarano, Mr. Forkter, and Mr. Sirico for having the interests of the people of Somers that you represent in stepping forward on this matter. For the others, we'll discuss this another time. Respectfully submitted, Roland C. Efron, 9 Lounsbury Drive, Baldwin Place, New York. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Roland. Please come up. I thought you Barbara, you said Barbara. Excuse me. Oh, try to one at a time, whatever however you guys want to. You come up next, Barbara. My name is Kevin O'Keefe. I'm a resident of uh, 11 Cornelius Lane. Okay. Uh, this is being addressed for those of you in Somers that are watching and, and maybe some of you that are watching from Carmel. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I, I tell you now, you probably know after this meeting, I come, I come before you today to address a pressing issue that needs to be brought to your attention. I would like to discuss five major points that make a lithium-ion battery energy storage facility unfavorable for our towns. Firstly, there is a high risk of fire and explosion, which can cause serious harm to property, residents, and first responders. Secondly, these facilities have the potential to contaminate our streams, reservoirs, and wells, posing a threat to our water supply. Thirdly, we need to consider the liability risk that this East Point Energy Group could face through its insurance policy. What insurance policies are they offering the residents in the, in the neighboring area? Fourth, there is a significant decrease in property values that comes with having a battery storage facility in our towns. Fifth and last, a potential threat to both domestic and foreign terrorism. I would like to focus on, fi on the fire safety aspect tonight. As Roland had mentioned a lot about the water, and I know I cannot cover all, all five points. I would like to refer to the 2023 Firefighter Safety Stand Down Manual, recognized by the International Association of Firefighters, AFL-CIO. 
This is a matter of great importance that requires immediate attention from the firefighters in Somers and Carmel. I urge you to take it seriously. I urge the chiefs and the fire departments to take this seriously. Why am I speaking on this matter? I am an ironworker delegate for New York State Ironworkers. I represent over 800 men, and the protection of my men is important to me. I can relate to that to the chiefs of the fire department, how important your firefighters are to you. I would like to read off some of the some key points off the firefighting operations with lithium ion batteries. Battery storage facilities must always be considered energized. Firefighters should exercise extreme caution when dealing with battery storage facilities and all energized electrical equipment. Request the utility company to respond. Do not make entry or approach the battery storage building or compartment. Introducing air may result in a explosion. Isolate the area. Recommend initial evacuation distance of 150 feet. Do not enter the fenced area. The exception to this is a several life known rescue. We, be aware of explosion potential of off-gassing of hazardous materials. White colored smoke is a good indication of hazard off-gassing. Place your apparatus in a safe location away from the battery storage and overhead power lines. Defensive firefighting. Water streams are preferred agent for response to lithium in ion battery fires. If a fire has not developed and only smoke is visible, take a defensive stance towards the system and be prepared to apply water to spray to exposures. If a fire develops, take a defensive stance toward the burning unit and apply water to the neighboring battery enclosures and exposures, meaning the, the, the battery that's on fire is expected. You're supposed to spray water on the existing battery surrounding it to keep it cool. Maintain a safe distance from the unit involved. 150 feet. Response crews should allow the battery to burn out. Water should be applied to adjacent battery enclosures and exposures. The incident commander will make the ultimate determination regarding hazard mitigation. The hazard mitigation plan should be developed in partnership with the utility representative and the responsible party. Firefighters must wear personal protective equipment with a face piece. From using the scale located on the bottom right of the site plan that anybody could pull up. The scale is located on the bottom right of the site plan that could give you the estimated footage, okay? The furthest, the furthest battery unit from the proposed Miller Road entrance is 400 feet. However, with the required 100 feet defensible perimeter, the only way to approach that fire would be through the literal backyards of properties along Lounsbury Drive and Somers. In the case of a fire on the northernmost battery, firefighters would have to access this fire from the Putnam County Trailway. This poses a serious safety concern for both the firefighters and the surrounding community. It takes 200 gallons of water to put out a Tesla car fire. The largest firefighter apparatus in New York City could only hold 500 gallons of water. It is expected to shoot water on surrounding batteries, but where is all this water coming from? Second, I'd like to, if you give me a few more moments here, I want to mention the threat of domestic and foreign terrorism. And why I speak on this matter, I have served, I have served my country as a sergeant of the United States Marines. I have served as a fire team leader in Afghanistan and a squad leader in Iraq. I am well aware how to think like the enemy and fight the enemy. It was mentioned that this facility could not have any personnel there for tw uh, 24 hours a day, or seven days a week. It was mentioned that they may have somebody stop by once in a while to, to check on, on, on the temperature or whatever the case may be. Please, let's consider middle, military strategy 101 here. Not to date every military campaign in un, human history, but let's start with the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. We have witnessed firsthand the impact of tar targeting infrastructure on both civilians and enemy military forces. While it may seem like a strategic move to disrupt the enemy's ability to communicate and function, it also results in severe consequences to innocent civilians who rely on these services for their daily survival. It also eliminates the opportunity for disgruntled civilians to communicate and band together to fight off enemy forces. Great strategy, isn't it? 
Military planners carefully targeted infrastructure, bridges, roadways, tunnels, and especially power plants. In our operations with unfortunate collateral damage, need I say more? Let's consider in current times the strategy of Russia and Ukraine, the strategy in Israel and Palestine. Some of the first targets was the electrical grid. Need I say more? Thank you for your time. Sir, just just one quick question. Were you able to give that information or to speak at the town board up in uh, Carmel or no? That was only a brief of my of my speech. I plan it to be. I did not speak to Carmel. Did you give them the information? I have not. I have not. I will. I I can give you this you anytime during the week or does it have to be now? OK, I will email it to you to have it on record there. And I mean, send it to Carmel, too. Yes, Carmel will definitely hear that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen, ladies. Uh, I'm Gloria Anderson. I reside in Heritage Hills, Unit 833A. I simply have a question for you. I'm wondering if you could give us a little further explanation about why Item 5 was removed from tonight's agenda and if there is another plan to go forward. Uh, so I'll just to answer that quick question, we got some information late, and we want to just take our time to review it. And then once we review it and have uh, everybody take a look at it, then we'll probably schedule it back again. Is that information available to the public to look at? Uh, it came in late uh, today that we want, but yes, I mean, I think, I think it would be able to go to the public as well. So we'll be able to distribute that. I think well, Dom has CC'd on it as well. It will be on the website? Uh, yeah, I think we, we can. I don't know if we'll be on the website, but no, I mean, um, society was CC'd on that. Uh, they should have a copy of it, of the letter that was sent to me. Okay. Yeah, we okay. just want to make sure we hear all the un un sides to it and what the rationale is. For Correct. Side, it Understood. Be Thank you. That's all. Calling to Mark. Okay. Sorry, we didn't get that one. No, uh, Thomas saying. Well, it was just a. It was. It was the eleventh. It was. It was sent the eleventh hour. So, okay. Very good. And that's why we just pulled it off, just to have time to review it. Right. I appreciate the explanation. All right. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Stewart. I live on fourteen Cornelius Lane, Baldwin Place, New York. Um. First off, I want to thank Mr. Scarano for his letter. I think that people have heard his message far and wide. And while this may not be necessarily a Somers issue yet, it can become one very quickly. And so I think I speak for myself and a lot of the other residents here that it's really admirable that you step forward and put that message out there. Thank you. Thank you. So we've heard a lot about the fires, and I think Kevin spoke really well about some of the fires. So I want to talk a little bit about something else. I want to talk about logistically what happens when the wind blows south. Because when that happens, when one of these fires erupts, and let's say not just one, not just two, let's say all the batteries go up in flames, and it goes south, the wind, now it becomes a SOMERS issue. And so let's think logistically about what we would do as a community to deal with this. So let's talk about sheltering in place. Immediately when people are told to shelter in place and one of these fires erupts, all households have to shut down air conditioning and heating and any parts of the house that have open ventilation. So if it's really cold out, well, think about that. If it's really hot out, think about that. If you've got small children and babies that have to be in a temperature between 60 and 70 degrees, think about that. Think about the fact that when a battery farm that was only 12 megawatts caused shelter in place evacuations for a few days, we're looking at 116 megawatt up here. So think about that, okay? So let's talk about what happens after the fire, okay? 
We've all sheltered in place. Hopefully everybody, you know, did okay. Well, after that, all of the filters in all of the homes in whatever distance has been deemed within the parameter, okay? Let's say it's a few miles. Every single one of those homes has numerous filters in their house. Every single one of those filters has to be replaced. The homes have to be power washed. Nobody can drink the water because many of us are well. And so if you don't have enough water in your home to get through that amount of time, what are you going to do? What are your kids going to do? What are your grandkids going to do? You got to hope that you have enough water, you have enough food. After the fires, who is going to come and test the water and test the air and test the ground? Because in talking to some of my friends in some of the highest government agencies that deal with these fires and the aftermath of them, all of these things have to be tested before it is safe to go outside, to drink your water, to let your kids play outside, to let them touch the ground, to let them touch the ground and put their hands on their face. These are things that we have to think about, okay? In East Hampton, there's a five megawatt lithium battery farm. Of course, there was a fire. It was a few hundred feet from the nearest residence. This is a 116 megawatt battery farm. So let's just use that as a best practice, right? Let's just use that as an example. So just with simple math, you're looking at, it really should be, let's say 7,000 feet, okay? Some of my friends just spoke about how close it was to their homes. That's not, that's not thousands of feet. That's not 7,000 feet. I wanna talk about the fact that while we do have a lot of data on these battery farms, and we are seeing that they do have the tendency to explode, okay? The thermal runaway, we all kind of get the picture. The aftermath of what chemicals are used to actually clean these things up, we're talking about toxic foams, we're talking about things that are gonna go into the landfill, we're talking about things that are gonna go into the water. I don't think any of us signed on to be guinea pigs. And the reason that I say guinea pigs or rather rats, right? Anytime there is a research study and we wanna look at safety, whether it's a drug, whether it's an environment, we usually don't use humans first, right? But these lithium battery farms are really still in the infancy of their creation. So we really don't know any data or acute, short-term, intermediate, or long-term effects on overall health. We don't know the impact on organ systems, on the lungs, on the heart, on the tissue of our dermis. We don't know the impact. And I don't think any of us here in Somers, in Mayapak, none of us signed on to be in some sort of longitudinal study to demonstrate the overall impact on safety, wellness, physical health in the short or the long term. Show me a 116 megawatt lithium battery farm that has been placed a couple hundred feet from residences, put the whole thing up on fire, put some people there, maybe just put some animals. Let's study them. Let's see what happens a week, two weeks, a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Let's look at the medical records. Let's look and see the overall impact of health on the animals, let's say, that live there. Do you want to be one of those guinea pigs? Do you want your children to be those guinea pigs? Do you want your grandchildren to be those guinea pigs? Who's going to pay for their hospital bills? What are you going to say to them when you kept them here, when you kept them in the homes, in the environment, in the town that you paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax bills that you thought was safe, that you thought the people sitting up here, sitting in these rooms were going to protect them? What are you going to say to your kids? Well, we thought it was safe. The government said it was safe. The state said it was safe. But we don't know that it's safe. And so until you can demonstrate to me that this is safe, that there isn't going to be a detrimental impact to my health, to my kids' health, how can we allow this to take place? It's just crazy to me. I'm somebody that believes in science. I believe in data. And I'm sure you all do too. So I'll ask you for a couple of things. For Somers, we ask that you put a moratorium on the ability to build 
these lithium battery farms here in Somers, putting zoning laws or codes, language I'm really not familiar with, putting something in place that at least puts it 7,000 feet away from the nearest home if it's a 116 megawatt battery farm, but put it somewhere where that's not in our backyards or just say no to it altogether. And please do everything in your power to help us fight what is being proposed in our backyards, because this is not just going to affect Mayapak. This is going to affect all of us. We see the wind, we see the storms. So just think about that. When you go home tonight and you close your eyes and you do your prayers and you're praying for safety of your loved ones, safety of your kids, safety of your grandkids, think about that because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people and we are not guinea pigs and we are not rats and none of us signed on to be some longitudinal study to demonstrate the overall impact on health and wellness to ourselves and our families. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, real quick, everyone, can I just, um, everybody will have an opportunity to speak. I just want to see a show of hands how many people actually want to speak this evening. Great. Okay. Just want to make sure because we're, we're allowing just on time factor and stuff like that. We don't want to cut anybody off uh, for time, but we just want to try to keep it to, to about five minutes or so. I know everybody's passionate about this subject and we want to we want to be uh, give the time for you to speak, but if we guys just hold it to five minutes, that would be that'd be great. We still have a board meeting to go, and we still have one speaker here tonight. So, um, but I will let everybody speak. Just if you guys just keep to five minutes, that'd be great. Thank you. I'll keep it under. My Thank name's you. Paul Harold. I've lived in Somers since 1959, so that makes me a little old. I was a member of New York City Police Department on 9/11. I went <clears throat> I went in with 19 guys. 12 of them are dead from fumes. Nothing else. Fumes. You got a governor who says, stay in place, close your window. That's what, and, and this is long term experience. You know, she comes up with, how did she know long term experience? This stuff just started. You know, I just don't get it. It's uh, like she said, children. You know, that's, that's what I just wanted to say, but please do something. You have. Hi, all. Um, I'm Lisa Cercelli, 27 Putney. I'm in the preserves. Um, I'm here with a bunch of other uh, preserves neighbors, and I think everybody here is speaking such great truth tonight to how the sentiment is in the community. There's a lot of fear, a lot of concern. Um, there's a lot of appreciation for what you did, Mr. Sarcano, uh, Scarano, I'm sorry. Um, and, um, I'm coming up here to speak a little bit to my personal experience since I think my peers have so well covered much of the concern to the community in terms of fire, environmental hazard, terrorism. Um, I'm a newly met. I got married in June. Thank you. It's the love of my life. Um, and I need to uh, going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back in town. I will. I will. We've never fought. Um, and it's been, we're, it'll be four years together in, in September. Um, but so we got married in June. We were actually looking for a house for a year. The housing market was so competitive that we kept getting outbid, all cash offers, uh, people waiving inspection, waiving everything. Um, and we lucked out with the most perfect home in the preserves. We moved in in November. And now six months later, um, we're looking at a lithium battery farm, potentially moving in less than a mile away. We are excited to start a family. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. Um, and I feel like so much of what everybody has said here about raising a family and being concerned about letting them touch the ground and letting them breathe the air is really uh, resonating with me. Um, you know, we're terrified. We're looking at a massive environmental issue right in our backyard, um, something that could affect our future, something that could tank our property value after making arguably the biggest purchase of our lives, um, and one in a market that was not friendly to first-time homebuyers. Um, 
And, um, you know, there's deep, deep concern that I have and that my husband has and that our entire family has now, um, being, they're all like from me, like essentially there's like 50 of them. Um, but I think, you know, it's the same fear of the community. We're concerned about our livelihoods, our health, our homes, our futures. And, um, I'd like to echo the sentiments said here in this room. I'd like to call for a moratorium on this project. And I'd like to request an amendment to the town code to prevent anything like this happening within town limits uh, ever in the future per perpetuity. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. How are you guys doing tonight? Very well, Guy. Guy Baker, number seven, Lounsbury, <clears throat> and uh, 278, Route 118. I've lived in town my whole life, 62 years, like Paul. Um, I've dug the test holes back there for two or three different engineers. Probably the same owner owned it. I didn't know that at the time. <clears throat> but like Roland said, um, the test holes filled up with water within a day or two. And if anybody doesn't know what the test holes are, they're seven foot deep uh, per calls or test holes. So anyway, the, the ground back there is so wet. That's the only place they could put this is the driest spot is right behind me and Roland's house. So, you know, I don't know if the same owner has owned since then but i worked for the engineers <clears throat> so just i don't understand that it, they know that this this is the only thing they can put there because they tried to put a senior housing in they tried to put a golf dome in there and nothing's working but this so they're trying to push this thing through so i just if you guys can do anything it would be great and you know <clears throat> Any vacant land, I'm just curious if they would do something like this behind Lincoln Hall. You don't know that, that some person could come in and if the Lincoln Hall's for sale or, you know, so the town has to do something moratorium or something against it. So I've lived there. To, I, I've seen Lounsbury Drive built. I was 11 years old when Lounsbury was built. I used to play in those fields. It were corn fields. And now... They're putting, trying to put this thing in. And everything empties into my stream. I have a stream behind my property uh, that feeds the reservoir. So that's New York City drinking water. So I don't know if the DC has got involved yet or if they're going to get, they should get involved. involved. So it's just, hopefully you guys can do something for us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Greetings. Good evening. Um, my name is Noelle Verboise Moriello. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of the town of Somers, maybe not as long as Guy <laughs> or Paul. Mm -hmm. um, to my new neighbor friend on Putney, this is a great place to live. It's really exciting. It is. It is. And the fact that the <laughs> goes up is incredibly important. So don't forget that. Um, and I, too, get emotional. <laughs> um, let's see. Where to begin? Um, first off, um, I live at 17 Lounsbury Drive um, with my husband, my two kids, my crazy Labrador dog. Um, I'd like to say good evening to Supervisor Scrano and the members of the Somers Town Board. Um, first off, uh, to Supervisor Scrano, um, fellow Tusker as well, class of 90, I'm 92, so you must be 93, okay? I'd like to thank you for your letter of opposition addressed to the Town of Carmel Planning Board regarding the proposed 160 megawatt lithium ion battery storage facility at 24 Miller Road in the town of Mayapac. I'm exhausted saying lithium ion battery. <laughs> yes, yes. It's been a long few weeks. Um, but thank you for publicly acknowledging 
um, a number of concerns shared by myself and the greater Baldwin Place, Somers, Mayapak community. Um, there's going to be a little bit, bit of overlap here. I promise not too much. I've been thrusting things out as people have been speaking. Um, but most significantly, the grave risk of overheating, off-gassing, thermal runaway, the possibility of explosion, the risk this poses to our families, our homes, our businesses, and the volunteer fire departments, and first responders of Somers and Mayapak. As stated in your letter just last summer, two much, much, much smaller facilities in New York State, Warwick and in East Hampton, which, uh, witnessed such catastrophic events and are still recovering, with East Hampton residents learning just a month ago of toxic groundwater contamination as a result of runoff, um, water that was used to extinguish the May 2023 fire at that facility. As you noted, it requires um, much more water than I think we even have access to on Lounsbury, but that's another issue aside. Um, my other concern is with the timing of the letter of opposition, and while I'm dearly grateful for it, um, I'm also concerned that the um, East Point Energy Company um, made their site proposal to the planning board in Carmel. Um, and my understanding is that Somers was notified in October of 2023. Um, and seeing as um, the letter wasn't posted until April of 2024, really only after area residents expressed their concerns to you and to the town board, um, my concern is that six months of silence in a very time sensitive process such as this is very concerning. Um, we now find ourselves in Baldwin Place, not to mention Mayapak, um, really in a race against the clock, preparing to gather information and to organize um, in, in advance of a public hearing um, that's further complicated by the crisscrossing of county lines and town lines. Um, and in light of all of this, it's my sincere hope that the town of Somers is looking to take proactive steps to protect its residents, its businesses, its homes, its families from similar circumstances. Sorry. No family should have a 116 megawatt facility in their backyard. It is, it defies common sense. And as much smaller BESS systems are creeping into our communities, like we've seen in Yorktown and in Jefferson Valley, with alarming speed and silence, um, we'd like to propose that you reevaluate any current local zoning codes to account for responsible, sustainable development while prioritizing the health and safety of families, homes, and businesses by limiting severely the size and scope. This is irresponsible. So with that, I promise to stop crying. <laughs> um, please continue to do what's right. Stand by your residents. Protect your community. We need you more than ever. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Cirillo. I'm at 22 Chambers Drive in the Preserve. I've been a resident here for 23 years now, and I do love my town. Uh, Town Supervisor Scarano, thank you for your support in opposing the proposed best battery energy storage system in Carmel. I'm personally opposed to this facility as it's an unnecessary environmental and safety risk to our community. I live within a half mile of this proposed project. Building such a project in a residential community is irresponsible and lacks good judgment. What has happened to common sense? Our government leaders have an ethical and fiduciary responsibility to put the best interests of the public as priority number one. Safety over tax revenue with, without second thought. Now that concludes my prepared speech. The scale of this project is enormous. We talk about 116 megawatts. What does that mean? I did some research, which was uh, available online, and I took a one megawatt system, all right? And I'll just give you some of the statistics here. For a one megawatt system, all right, the weight of that facility, the, the big cage that it comes in, and the batteries 
is 48,500 pounds. That is 24 and a quarter tons, all right, in one unit for one megawatt. All right, so now let's do the math. All right, to generate one megawatt, all right, the energy density, and most batteries are going to be the same for all these commercially available, uh, is approximately 3.5 kilowatt hours. So you need 286 batteries, all right, to make one megawatt. So that's 286 batteries, and I'll just convert it into pounds, which was each battery weighing approximately 70 and a half pounds. So that ends up being 20,177 pounds of lithium batteries. So just to bring the context of this, all right, that's for one megawatt, all right? So that's 10 tons in a single unit. Multiply that by 116 times 10 tons, all right, is 1,160 tons of lithium that will be sitting in our backyards. We don't need all 116 of these things to go up in flames. We just need one. And remember, that one, right, was the 24 and a half tons of lithium that will sit there and burn. It's not if, but it's when this thing will go up in flames. And what they don't tell you is these are self-contained units that are designed to control the fire. But when you say control a fire so it doesn't escape the unit, there's all kinds of ventilation systems that vent all of the toxic, exactly, the, the toxic fumes into the air, which we will breathe. So 116 megawatts, yeah, now we know. 1,160 tons of batteries sitting in our backyard. All right. Not to mention, you have to listen to the whirring of the air conditioners that have to keep these things cool and the heaters to keep them warm in the winter. We don't have to look any further than Governor Hochul's own New York State Interagency Fire Safety Working Group recommendations. All right. The fire co recommendations go on and on. All right. The first item to this gentleman's point was Division of Homeland Security and Energy Services. That's the number one item. Office of Fire Prevention and Control, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Department of Public Service and Fire, the Department of State and Nation Leading Best Safety Industry Experts. Authorities having jurisdiction, this is a lot of jargon I'm not even familiar with, but we have no experience with this, obviously. Carmel hasn't. Uh, we had a fire in our own community recently. I think there were four fire departments called for one fire, mm -hmm. one home that burnt, burnt down. Imagine how many fire departments would be needed to put out a fire at a best facility. It's insanity. They talk about peer reviews that have to be done. This is all part of Governor Hochul's fire safety. They talk about explosion control provided by lithium bests in rooms, areas of walk-in energy storage is therefore not required for the existence of best units. I mean, there's things, let me just go back. The first thing that this thing says, background and scope, following a series of fires at three battery energy storage systems locations across New York State in 2023, Governor Hochul convened an interagency fire safety working group to address the safety concerns around lithium ion batteries. Now, nowhere in this report does it talk about the placement of a battery energy storage system. Nowhere. It completely ignores the fact 
And here we want, not we, the town of Carmel is being asked to consider putting one of these facilities in a residential area. This is insanity. Someone came up here earlier and said they, they, they believe in the science. I believe in the science too. I, I, I don't disagree that this may have a future, but not in a residential area. This is insanity. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Thanks, Paul. Right, thank you so much thank you. for your support. Thanks, Paul. So I just want to say a few things here. And thank you uh, for everybody who says uh, thank you for the letter. But this is not just only a, a letter that that I have that I, I wrote and signed my name to. This is also a, a complete town board uh, letter as well, even though my name was just signed on it. So this is a full... Uh, full town board, uh, a letter sent to the Carmel Planning Board. Okay. Just want to make sure that everybody knows that. And it took a lot of research on his part to essentially yeah. get it together. Quantify it. So it had the most impact. Yes. My name is Stephanie um, Azadian. I pull that mic close. Sorry. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Good. Um, my name is Stephanie Azadian and I live at 11 Lounsbury. Um, I do want to say thank you to you all for writing such a well-written letter. Um, I do have two questions and I don't really know if this is the form four questions or if it's just really to voice our concerns. Um, one of my major concerns is how could something like this be even thought about and put in without any notification to anybody in any area around this facility? This facility is literally in my backyard, 200 feet off of my backyard. And I have received no word about it. In fact, a couple of weeks ago in February, I was driving down Miller Road and I saw some people there and something prompted me to start researching this. And I came across the site plans and then I gathered my neighbors and I said, we have to figure something out. That's how we found out about this. So one of my questions is, what can we do going forward? Can we amend something? Can we put something in writing that states that there needs to be new notification codes in place? I understand that we're going to be notified about a public hearing. But I feel like that's going to be too late. Um, and then the next question I have is, I think it's great that you wrote the letter, but where are we going now? What are we going to do to, I don't know where, what we can do to stop this facility at this point. Um, but I think it's super imperative to put a moratorium in so that this does not happen in Somers. Um, I believe Yorktown just placed a moratorium the other day. Uh, so I think it's just I, I just think that there's there should be some guidance about where we go to next. How do we continue moving forward? How do the residents get information about this? I mean, we're attending all of the Carmel meetings, planning board, town board. But I feel like we're kind of lost. We're not we're not getting a lot of information. We're not we're not being heard. And I know we're being heard here. So that's great. And I appreciate that. Um, and I know I understand there's going to be a public hearing. I understand that. Um, but I guess the two things is, is there really should be something, a more pending notification to residents within any, within miles of, of something like this. I shouldn't have had to go online and see that this is being proposed in my backyard. And then I, I urge you all to put a moratorium in. Thank you. And thank you for writing such a thank you. letter. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody, uh, if anybody leaves, right. If you want to get up and you, and you leave, just let the door close on its own. The door's kind of broken, so um, broke just the other day. It closes real slow, so don't pull on it. You're welcome, Pat. Good evening, um, Supervisor Scarano, other members of the board. My name is Scott Moriello, and I live at 17 Lounsbury Drive in Baldwin Place, New York. Um, I wrote you a letter, Mr. Scarano, about the proposed 100 megawatt battery energy storage system back in March 28th. I want to first publicly thank you for getting back to me so quickly uh, and my neighbors. Since you have written a, uh, a, a detailed, uh, since then, sorry, uh, you have written a detailed letter to the Carmel Planning Board, and I thank you for your time and attention. As you know, this battle has just begun, and we need additional assistance, and we have additional questions. First, a couple of concerns. You have five members on the town board and three board members made our concerns a priority. We know this because I received a phone call personally uh, and several others in my uh, neighborhood have received emails and phone calls. 
The fact that the other two board members have not reached out to any of my neighbors or visited the proposed site is disappointing. Um, I hope that they will make this a priority in the future. Secondly, this project was presented before the Carmel Plan Board meeting, Carmel Planning Board, sorry, in October of last year. They were obligated to notify the town of Somers uh, of this potential plan. And I wanna know why it took the outrage of my neighbors to get the town board to act. If this letter had been written earlier, we may not be in the situation we're in right now. Why did it take so long? I'd really appreciate an explanation for that. Lastly, what are your next steps? I understand that this is clearly a jurisdictional issue, but we know this company, an $80 billion company, Equinor, has enormous resources. And we know that the owner of the property has powerful connections in the town of Carmel. And we know that this is purely a profit venture for NYSIC. Has the Somers Town Board contacted NYSIC? If NYSIC came out publicly against this project, Equinor would pull out immediately. But NYSIC won't because they stand to make millions of dollars buying energy at low prices and selling it back to us at the highest price. This is arbitrage. I had to learn that vocabulary word. I hate that. Okay. It's shameful. They claimed that this massive facility will reduce power outages, which is simply untrue. 16 megawatts can run Somers and Carmel Homes for an entire year. This means they have 100 megawatts of power left sitting there. What is that for? To sell back to us at outrageous prices. I implore you to express your concerns to Avangrid, this $13 billion parent company that owns NYSIC. Will you write a letter expressing your absolute opposition to NYSIC? They already get enough money from us, and now their profit venture will put Mayapak and Somers businesses and neighborhoods and families in danger. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Grillo. I'm a resident of the preserve uh, for 19 years. I live on the cul-de-sac end, which is closest to this uh, lithium battery farm that they want to put in. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, so I'm kind of just wrote down a whole bunch of stuff that trying not to repeat what everyone else has said. Um, there was a couple of things that were said to me from someone on the Carmel board that I had spoke to that I kind of want to address and maybe you guys can clarify it for me. Um, number one, they told me that the Mayapak Fire Department was approving this. That to me is insane. I don't even know how that even could be. Um, I'm hoping and praying Somers Fire Department is not on board for this. Um, is anyone prepared for this? Um, I haven't looked into um, exactly what it takes to be prepared for this, but from my understanding, there's training, there's money, there's resources, so much more is involved. Um, sadly, the last time I was standing here, um, some of you were here um, when we were fighting the pipeline that was trying to come through our development and the wonderful picking station that was supposed to go four houses down from my house. Um, I fought back then, and it seems like I'm reliving that same nightmare. I watched the YouTube videos of the Carmel board meeting of this company down south. Same thing was, was happening last time. They don't even live here. It's not in their backyard, so they don't care. Same conversation. I'm listening to him say the same speech over again. You won't see it. We'll put up trees. It won't be in your view. They think that if they doll it all up and we can't see it, that that's okay. That's their justification. It was almost nauseating watching this man speak 
because it's the same thing I relived 13 years ago. And now my children were little. And just as they were saying, my kids were little and I was worried back then. Can I let my kids go outside? Can I let them ride their bikes? It was the same situation. Um, it was putting our health at risk. It was also going to affect our house values. It's the same thing all over again. But I will tell you, we did fight and we did win and we got them out. And I think it takes a lot of fight to do it and it can be done. And everybody from my development understands that it can be get done. But the rest of the town, I don't think they really understood it because it wasn't coming through their development. So, I, I mean, I'm disappointed that there's no one here tonight. I, I don't know if there's enough knowledge about going on that this town was, that, that our meeting was tonight. Um, I would like to see going forward, we can have a meeting like this in a much bigger place so people feel that they can get parking, they can get seats. I, I, I don't understand. Sometimes it just I, I, it baffles me. What does it take for people to get to a meeting? This is insane. This is not healthy. This is not good for uh, anybody. No matter where you live in Somers, this is not working out. Even Heritage Hills, uh, that whole community should be here and out in droves. It's going to affect them too. Um, uh, the irony of the whole thing, which was also told to me from someone from town board that I spoke with, this storage of energy, which is going to be stored, is not even for us. It's for to benefit Lower Westchester which was the same conversation I had with the pipeline company. That whole gas that they were trying to go from 24 to 36 was to benefit the Northeast. So it wasn't even, a, it wasn't even for us. So it, it, it is reliving that same nightmare. And I, I, I mean, I'd like to think that, like they had said, I don't understand why this is coming out so late in the game. I, I mean, when we knew about the pipeline, we were on it immediately. And we tried, we, you know, we tried as a development to fight it and we got it and we got it done and we went to multiple meetings. And I feel like we're, we're too far along, not too far. I don't want to sound like, you know, that this, that we're thrown in the towel, but we could have been doing this six months ago. So from what I, I don't understand, why was this the best kept secret between both our towns? Why are our communities not aware of this? And I, I just... I mean, I'm, I'm one to fight. And when it has to do with my kids' health, my family's health, my neighbors, I've lived there for almost 20 years. None of us deserve this. And I can't get my head around the state that we live in thinks that this is okay. It should never have gotten to it. I don't care what political party you are from. This is not normal. This is not normal to think to put this in a residential area. Same with our pipeline with that pigging station. It's pretty much the same health risks that you are putting our community out. And in particular, the poor families that live in Lounsbury, not that it wouldn't affect us as the same, but they're right there. They have pools in their backyard. I mean, they're kids. I mean, I can't even how anybody, I don't care where you sit, think this is normal. And I don't know what is it going to take? What is it? You know, I don't want it to be that it's going to take four more months for us to gather as a town to say that this is not acceptable. This is not going to happen. And I don't want to hear about because I heard two comments already. And I, I think it's like two year old talk. Well, Somers didn't, you know, ask about, you know, when we you did stuff on the Mayapac line. I, I can't listen to stupid stuff like that. I, it, our towns are our towns. We all live together, whether you're in Putnam County, Westchester County, Somers, Mayapac. We're all the same people. We all live here. We all reside here. We want to stay here. We have a right to stay here. This is all coming down to money as the pipeline is. And I expect everyone in this town to start fighting. Stop sitting on your phones and writing how you think this is horrible. Get to the meeting. Do what it takes to stop this. It can be done, but everybody's got to do it. It can't just be the same people sitting in this room. And I get that feeling. We're going to be right back here having another meeting and it's going to be the same people sitting in these. What is it going to take? So I would like to think that if you guys get a bigger place and let's really put it out there, I don't care how you want to blast it, put on your code red or something. 
and say, you need to get to this meeting. We need to fight this as a, as a town and put a moratorium on it just to put to push this down the road because we did that with the pipeline. We pushed it, we pushed it and it got pushed all the way out. That's it. They walked away finally. I don't know what it took. I don't even care, but this could be the same scenario. Mm. So what is it going to take for us as a town to fight this and get this out of here like we got the pipeline? I do not want to live like this. I will not live like this, and it's not acceptable. So I would like to have guidance from you. How are we going to do this going forward? And I would love to know answers of why it took six months. I would have stood here six months ago standing and fighting for this. So please give us guidance on where we're going to go. And please do not wait. I would hope by another week from now, we can have some type of game plan because all this is going fast. And it's not even like it's in Somers that we're fighting this. This is a, more of a Carmel Maya pack thing. They're not letting us speak there. They won't let us speak there. And I understand that because I don't like people coming into our town talking about things going on in our town. So I'm not being hypocritical, but it's a difficult situation. We're fighting this on the, on the other side, and I don't want to do that. I want to fight it together, but I, want, I would like to know that our town is going to fight full 100%. Let me just say, I think they should let you. I think they should hear you. They may not. I understand. I understand. Oh, no. That was very disappointing to hear that they won't. You know, we had said before this, if people from Carmel come, they can speak. We're not going to a debate if they want to, because it does affect both towns, because you're right on the line. And just seems to be something. Well, maybe we can talk about that later. But it is uh, there's a practicality. Can you meet till two in the after two in the morning? I guess. But I think they should have heard your concerns because you're right there. You're closer to it than most mm -hmm. people in that town. So it, I'm just wondering. Okay. okay. No, no. Good evening. My name is Danielle Reyes. This will be quick. I live at 16 Cornelius Lane in Baldwin Place. I've been enjoying life here from the Bronx uh, for 21 years. And I, I, I don't have all the technical information that my neighbors have. But I have to say, you know, you mentioned before, Mrs. Carano, that you said, I know you're passionate about this. We do not want to be passionate about this. It was forced upon us. We are scared. We're terrified. We're sleepless. Mm -hmm. And with all due respect to all of you up there, you were all voted in, right? You, you're the men and women of power. Hold your power tight this time and fight for us. We need you. We voted you in for us to represent us. Please represent us well. Please represent us well. We're human beings just like you. We have better passions than this to put our attention on. We have great passions where we are a good group of hardworking, taxpaying people. Please help us fight. We are scared. We are not passionate. We're scared. We're terrified. And we're not going to sleep on this. We're not. I don't want to be forced to put my house up for sale because my choice is sell it or sleep sleep with a you know a, an evac pack ready to evacuate when something goes wrong please help us that's what we're here for and with all due respect that's why you were voted in help us how you doing my name is uh stephen stewart 14 cornelius lane my family has lived here for very many, many years. Um, you might know my dad, mom, Bob and Betsy Stewart of Stewart's Farm. My dad has sat up here for many, many years. He's fought a lot for this town. You know, when I met my wife, Michelle Stewart, who speaks you know, very well, um, you know, where did we want to move? Where We could move anywhere. We moved to Somers because I grew up here. I loved it here. Great place to raise a family. And with talking to my father, he's got a lot of connections and when I speak to a lot of the retired chiefs, the fire chiefs of Somers, retired chiefs of Mayapak, you know, they are all against this. But according to the planning board of Carmel, they are on board. And I don't understand how that is. When I speak to um, one of the firefighters who my dad is really good friends with, he says, we can't fight this. Number one, we're a volunteer fire department. Who is going to fight this for seven days? Who? The FDNY can't fight it. They're trained and paid professionals. You think a volunteer person is like myself is going to put it out, risk my life. I have two little kids. They're not. 
say, and they say these things are very safe. They only, you know, what causes them to fire? Storms. Let me paint you a picture. Do we get storms around here? I think they've gotten worse since I was a little kid. You know, I feel we get more power outages now than when I was five years. I don't know why that is, but that's just the way it is. So say it's January 7th, 2 a.m. We have a foot of snow. It's snowing. Fire breaks out. No water containment. What happens? What do we do? You know, it's funny because the energy company has this awesome map that says, oh, here's the evacuation zone. It only goes here. Do they have something that I don't know about that they don't understand them with a 30 mile while gust of wind going south? That's going to, there's a magic area that it's just not going to blow by. Like, it, I don't know where they come up with this. I mean, have they set a 116 megawatt facility on fire somewhere and watched it? Did they see where the winds blow? Did they see what it did to the what? You know, it, I could go on and on. But, you know, speaking with my father, you know, I know you mentioned the DEIS for an environmental impact study. But have you contacted the watershed? Have you contacted them? You know, they should be notified because when, when this does catch fire, and it's just a matter of time when it does, and it goes into the Amawak Reservoir, which feeds New York City. Does New York City know about this? Have you got them behind this? Because if they knew the ticking time bomb that's going to happen to them, I think they would want to know about it. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, give me a second. Got emotional because I lost friends. Three of these uh, lithium <laughs> farms, is not a joke, uh, Long Island, summer of 23, all three caught on fire. There was a school close by. Teachers came back. They wanted their school. Did it get to the school? So they wiped down the school. They found the lithium results. And all the filters in the school, they came in, wiped down kids' desks, lithium. Anybody thinking about the schools? No. They're in, within three schools within a mile radius of where this is going to take place. Another one, Kutchog, Long Island. They're trying to put one in right now. They put a moratorium on it because the fire department out there can't handle it. There's one in, in Arizona. I put all these online, maybe some of you read it, showed up, started to burn, was smoldering. Two firemen walked up to the door, opened the door. One was blown 70 feet through a chain link fence, had lacerations of his kidneys and, and, and everything. He died. Didn't say that in the paper, but I have a friend who lives in Arizona. That's how I found out about it. The other fireman was only thrown 50 feet. He's in intensive care stalk. This is what we're dealing with. You know, these are not toys, especially the size of what they want to put in. I live on Cornelius Lane, so I'm 500 feet away. You know, the whole neighborhood could, you know, I left because even in the, is it best, the paperwork you get, it tells you if this blows, it throws shrapnel. They have a video online where they put one of these things in a metal container, like a, you would see it going across on one of the big boats in the ocean. It blew the doors, not off, to pieces. We couldn't even find the doors. This is what we're putting in some of these people, 100 feet in their backyard. I don't get it. But I appreciate it, guys. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to add a couple of more inconvenient facts um, that I thought about. Let's talk about terrorism for a moment. Uh, my last couple of years with Con Ed, I spent uh, building... Uh, missile barriers around all the transformers because of some psycho down south and out in California that shot the transformer and, and, and created a lot of outages from there on. So in my mind, with all the terrorists that are running through this country right now, unchecked, un, un, unknown, uh, somebody with the 30 or six from a half mile away on a blinding uh, snowstorm could put a round right through one of these things in the middle of the night with 12 inches of snow on the ground and it's gonna burn. And the fire department will not make it. And that's why I want to take you guys for a walk back there so I can show you the grade. No fire apparatus is going to make it up from Miller Road. And to, and to come in on the other side, well, you're going through all the swamps. Who knows if the roads will be able to handle the apparatus. But in the event of an evacuation, something like that takes place, and the fire department has to come in 
and you can't access it through their roads, they're going to come through Guy's property, my property, Stephanie's property, or Mark's property. They're going to come in off of Lounsbury. That's the only. That's the easiest way to get in right now is my driveway or Stephanie's driveway or Guy's driveway. Then beyond that, for water, when we built the Amawalk Shenrock Water District, we put a hydrant down on the corner of Meadow Park. Will that be used for this fire? You know, I, I know I'm asking a rhetorical question, but something to think about. Is that going to be a source of water? Because it's certainly not going to be able to shuttle water in. There's not enough water they can drill wells for and contain this. So just something to think about. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on up. Oh, no. Uh, guys, this will be the last comment. Who's that guy, Dan? <laughs> Hi, Tommy Smith, 15 Carpenter Place. I want to thank you for that letter. That was a good letter. All right? One thing I haven't heard. What about lawsuits? Can we file some lawsuits against the uh, planning board, Armel? No? I don't know. Well, they, everything you have to wait until they make a decision. Why can we jump? You know, can't we can try? <laughs> All right, well, I tried <laughs> next time. All right, there's no other further questions. I'm gonna make a the motion to close out public comment for this evening. Second, all in favor, aye, aye. So move, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys don't have to stay around for to listen anymore for the meeting. But if anybody gonna take a, to go for, call. we will. I'm gonna take a five minute break for a few seconds, right? I go check on my daughter real quick. All right, bye, bye guys. Have you had any other topics? We hope not. <laughs>
Sorry, Supervisor, just hang on. We're not uh, yeah, live. Give, just yeah. Wait till most people clear out. There's still people here at the, the, the podium. All right, when you, guys are, when you guys are ready to go live, you just got to give me a second again. Okay, I'll tell you when in a minute. All right, thanks. You want to come at 11? Yeah. All right. I'm glad people came out. Very, very glad people came out. She just, my wife just came out. Of course, very, very we're going to be finished. Give them four. Um, hold on, Paul. I just want to make real quick. All right, stand by. No, hold on. I'm going to take number two. All right, stand by a second, guys. <laughs> Your tree's going to fall on my property. Uh, speed now. Thank you. Done. Right, guys, we are live again. All righty, welcome back, everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, left. Lost it. left. Wait for the outside. <laughs> We're going to uh, go on to the rest of the town board here tonight. Uh, first, let's give a, a town of Somers update. Old bet. The obelisk will be set on Monday. So we're moving right along, hoping to get this back up for World Circus Day. We're we're uh, moving real nice on this. So the obelisk will be up on Monday uh, along with the scroll. And then I don't know if the elephant is going up that same day, uh, but we hope- uh, You mean know, on the 20th or- oh, We're not putting it up on the 20th. 20th. We're gonna It'll have be it. up on the 20th. It'll be up on the 20th. Okay. We're, I don't know if we're gonna put it up on the, uh, on the pedestal on Monday or sometime later that week. Yeah, it goes. So we just have to get the um, the obelisk up first and and uh, make sure it's uh, center and straight. All right. uh, the other thing too, um, senior at the senior center, they are planning a trip uh, to Wind Creek Casino. So if you are interested in going to that, please, uh, <laughs> for, uh, contact the senior center for more information. It's an important one. That is. That's the first time we've had a, a trip in in quite some I'm, time. So. I to a gambling or to a, to a casino. So we're going to a casino. So the first one back. Which casino? So, uh, Wind Creek. And I think that's in the Poconos. No. Oh, I didn't ever heard of it. Bethlehem, Bethlehem, yeah. Bethlehem, PA. Are all our senior students over 18? <laughs> yes, they are. They, yes. They, uh, I think you have to be uh, fun to get in. You know, we're, we are all a little punchy, so. a little punchy right now after that. <laughs> um, we're going to remove number two, Somers Energy Environment Committee update from Don Bleasdale. Since we ran over on time, uh, Don will uh, be rescheduled for next week. I want to thank Don for reading the room. Yes. It's better. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Let's move on to number three. Uh, refer request to place no parking signage in the vicinity of 10 and 11 Dogwood Road uh, to the Somers Health <laughs> Department, Police Department, Engineering Department, and Bureau of Fire Prevention for evaluation. I'll make the motion to further request. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Number four, authorize the supervisor to execute the proposal from uh, Stephen Tilly, architect, complete the Elephant Hotel building condition survey of basement update in the amount of 3000 required for the submission of a CFA EPFP grant. I'd like to make the motion to authorize. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, so move. Number five, we remove for this evening. Uh, on to parks and recreation. Uh, authorized supervisors to execute the proposal to purchase a double-sided full-color Atlas outdoor LED sign from Stewart Sign in the amount of 29804 to be funded by the fund balance for capital projects. For March 25th, 2024, email from Steve Ross and Superintendent of Parks and Recreation. So where is this going? This is, this is going to go in the front of uh, Reese Park. So instead of having the... It's going to be facing right towards... Mr. Clinch's right house. towards his house. Highest, and highest we, setting possible. The highest. Oh, have, we, have we gotten, I mean, there are some people who will not like that because of the placement in the historic corridor. Have we, we asked them their input on this? No, we have a little bit. Yeah. Just the design the, and the, the design of it. I know we had mentioned it to them 
uh, what we were looking for. Uh, the same side, the side is the sign is going to be the same size as the one that's currently there. Yeah. It will be double sided. Uh, we'll make it a lot easier for uh, Parks and Rec to notify people of upcoming events. Um, yeah, I was talking to the the superintendent yesterday about it. Now, is there something about advertisements on it though? Is that correct? May or may not. We're looking into that. If uh, I would say if we're going to do that in a different place in town on a hundred or something, maybe the Chamber of Commerce would like there. I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I think I'm fine because it's modern technology. It'll be controversial when this fire department put up theirs. That was controversial uh, by the fire department. So this probably will be, but I understand it. I, I think advertisements probably in that place would not be appropriate. That's my opinion. Yeah, we can we can uh, address that as we we uh, we come to it. But I think for the most part, you know, this is going to look for. Um, you know, informing the public, especially a high traffic area like Reese Park, uh, you know, letting people know when SISO events are, or signages, camp is happening. Just and an emergency. Up. And an emergency. That's an important thing. Mm -hmm. And this way, no one has to go out and actually just manually put the, the letters on there. Yeah, he can, uh, he can do it right from his computer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I understand. So I'll make the, uh, the motion authorized. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. So move. And authorized to execute the proposal to purchase four life pack uh, CR2 fully automatic AD response systems from Advantage Emergency Devices. And that is in the amount of 15,469 spot 44 to be funded by the fund balance for capital projects uh, per March 25th, 24, 2024 email from Stephen Ralston, Superintendent of Parks and Recreation. Um, this will be four AED machines strategically placed throughout Reese Park and one at Van Tassel. Uh, I think it's... Uh, away, God forbid, there's ever sort of uh, an emergency where someone needs to get to the AED. We had a person come in and show us what they'll look like. You'll be able to use your phone, call 911, tell them where you're located. They'll give you the code for it. You'll be able to punch in the code on the AED machine yeah. and you'll have access to the AED. That's a lot better than the old key. Better than the old key. People. Matt, Tom, do you remember we had discussed this years ago. We had somebody, it once, but somebody broke into it or they did something. It was, a, I think it was a glass one or something like that. All right. That this, is the, better. this is in a nice containment box. Yep. We'll be able to get that open it up code. through a code. That's a, a good idea. Um, so anybody who... They're so easy to use. They are. You don't have to know anything. It mm -hmm. tells you what to do. So it's a good thing. I'll make the, uh, the motion authorized. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So move. No financial. Let's move on to highway. Request permission to purchase... One 2024 Ram 2500 Tradesman 4x4 in the amount of 61,849 spot 66, and then one Dodge uh, 2024 Durango uh, in the amount of uh, 48,380 spot 41 uh, from Robert Green Truck off the Onondaga contract number 0010808 per memo dated March 28th. 2024 from Nicholas DeVito, superintendent of highways. So, so the, the record is right. It's 61, 894, 66. You, you transposed it. No. I did. Yep. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is already in the budget. Right? Spot 66. Six. Spot 66. All right. Spot 66, as you know. Yeah. Uh, I'll make sure you got that. I'll make the motion for uh, to request permission. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. There's current vacancies in the Affordable Housing Board. There's an upcoming vacancy for the Affordable Housing Board as well. Uh, again, if you're interested in serving on one of the town boards, please contact my office so uh, we can set up a, a, a time uh, to meet with you. And then uh, number three, authorize the the appointment of Michelle DeCola as part-time intermediate clerk in the Somers Police Department, effective retro to March 18th, 2024, an hourly rate of 25 per memo dated March 12th, 2024, 2024 from Brian Linkletter, Chief of Police. I'll make the motion to authorize. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so moved. And then uh, acknowledge the the appointment of Rebecca Wintle to the Somers Library Board of Trustees to fill an unexpired term of Bill Keene effective March 20th, 2024, and ending December 31st, 2024. I'd like to make the motion to acknowledge. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'd like to thank Bill. Um, Bill was there a short time, but you could tell that he was very engaged in things. He just... Her, you know, his work schedule and all um, sort of got loaded up. So we hope that uh, if things uh, uh, slow down for him in the future, he might uh, might look to get back on another board in town because I think he was a very interested party and somebody who uh, was always willing to work with anybody. 
Right. I did speak with him, and he did say perhaps in the future he would do exactly as you say. Good. That's great. Bring him forward. All right. Um, nothing for planning and engineering. Nothing for the police. And then, uh, and then the uh, for one the proposed consent agenda move to next week. Okay. Sure. Calendar of events coming up. Um, April eighteenth, our town board regular meeting. March second. I mean, sorry, May second and May 9th, our work session regular meeting. And then June 6th and June 13th, work session, regular meeting. All those times are starting at 7 p.m. Do you, uh, I'll, I'll go through the town board announcements here real quick. Um, World Circus Day is coming upon us. That is Saturday, April 20th, right here at the Elephant Hotel, where we'll be unveiling the new Old Bet. 11 a.m. will be the dedication. Uh, and that takes us to about 11.45. Then we'll come inside. Outside, there'll be some display stuff for the kids to do. Um, there'll be some events for the kids outside and then there'll be some screenings inside as well, starting around 12 o'clock. Uh, keep Somers beautiful litter cleanup. That's going to be Saturday and Sunday, the 20th and 21st. And that's at 9 a.m. to 3 and then 9 a.m. to 12 on that Sunday. Supplies and registration at Keep Somers Beautiful 10th Town Hall. And that is in the Elephant Hotel parking lot. Partners in Prevention, they decided to present uh, the one's choice five, what parents and caring adults need to know about youth substance use prevention with Dr. Caroline DuPont, Nancy Pasquale, and Debbie Burnt. I'm, I'm horrible at names. You guys know that. And that is Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, and that's 7 to 8.30 via Zoom. Um, and if um, go to knowtoprevent.org, to get more information. Somers Women's Club Blood Drive, and that's Saturday, April 20th. That's at 9 a.m. to 3, Somers Intermediate School Cafeteria. Somers Lions Pancake Breakfast, Sunday, April 21st, 8 to 12. That's at Somers High School, $10 uh, per person for a donation. And of course, they had their pancakes, egg sausage, breakfast. Town of Somers Arbor Day event. Uh, details will follow, but that will be Friday, April 26th. Westchester County Mobile Shredder coming to Somers Tuesday, May 14th. It's at Reese Park, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. The annual statewide ban prohibiting residential brush burning now through Tuesday, May 14th. This has been going on since 2009. Hold the date. Town of Somers Independence Day celebration, which will be Wednesday, July 3rd. That will be at Reese Park starting at 5 o'clock. Patty, any additional? Of course. Sweet. Today, April 11th, is the unofficial holiday celebrating National Submarine Day. Commemorate <laughs> yeah, it's going. Commemorates the day in 1900 when the U.S. Navy acquired the USS Holland, its first modern commissioned submarine. Huh. That was from Linda's wonderful daily calendar. Ooh. And this one was is for yesterday, but I heard it while watching the Yankee game, so I figured I'd bring it out. Absolutely. Requirement. <laughs> On this day in 19, on April 10th in 1913, the New York Highlanders played their first MLB game as the New York Yankees, losing to the Washington Senators 2-1 to one at Griffin Stadium. Griffith Stadium. President Woodrow Wilson threw out the first pitch. What year was that? 1913. Yeah. How old were you, Rick? Yeah. So, you're four by then? Yeah, you were at the game, right? You were looking through the <laughs> hole in the back in the Keep in school. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Isn't this meeting over? <laughs> Bill, anything? Uh, yeah, a couple things coming up. It's actually in May, but May 3rd and 4th uh, is the Somers uh, Lions Club hosting the track meet um, at Somers High School. A huge event. And uh, the Somers uh, Lions Club Carnival has been backed up from April to May. I think it's going to be much better weather for us and it's actually on mother's day weekend so it's going to be may 9th 10th 11th 12th beautiful. um so bring mom and show her a nice time <laughs> beautiful and then a prize i'm sure it's what they are <laughs> a prize and <laughs> winner a prize <laughs> yeah do it do one better bring your kid leave mom at home yeah <laughs> give her a rest I'm give her, appreciate give, that even more give her a rest rich anything 
Uh, I was just I was just struck tonight at the meeting of the uh, depth of uh, what, what was fright, scared. Uh, I was I was struck by that, and I have all these questions I'm going to have to pose to Roland at some point. Does the DEC weigh in and the DEP weigh in? And there's something about uh, state law when it's on a a border between not only towns but counties. I know that they send out for uh, you know well, asking your opinion of various things. But it seems like those things require more close consideration and perhaps town law. I don't know. But these are just things that go through my mind uh, with that. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I think I'm not sure what we can do, but I think we can put pressure or we can bring it to the attention of our state senator and our state assembly person who people just told me, said, well, we've contacted. They don't con they don't answer us back. So I think we can probably help on that. But is it? This is a difficult one. Well, I think everyone out there that spoke today should you know, essentially summarize their thoughts and essentially CC the folks that are on, you know, the, our, our state and, and federal representatives. Because essentially this is, uh, you know, this is governed by the state and the federal government at some point. It's just out, outrageous that uh, they're trying to put something of this capacity in such a, such, in such a location. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's procedural. I mean, Roland, you've advised, essentially this gets, has been defeated based on safety and fire in other communities. Another community, yes. Uh, the fire departments there took a much more active role than apparently is happening here. So all the folks that we, uh, what's, uh, we're saying the Yorktown Fire Department, our fire department, essentially, Rob, they opposed it, right? Uh, I know Somers has. Uh, I can't speak for your town, or can I speak for Mayor Packer Carmel? Uh, but I know our fire department is uh, our Bureau of Fire Prevention, and uh, and our, our fire department has has opposed this. Um, and I'm sure they're going to be crafting their letter in, in opposition as well, and for safety uh, situations uh, in regarding uh, a potential uh, fire. Um, you know, in, in the letter, we, we laid out a bunch of things, you know, the, our concerns for them. We'll continue to to uh, push where we can and try to, you know, get some more steam on this to uh, help with our with our residents and their and their uh, their concerns and and how people are scared. And I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and um, voicing your uh, your concerns. I think it's um, it's good for all of us to hear. Uh, what the community is thinking, you know, and, um, you know, and some of the points, I think we need to get more people out there to voice it, uh, not just the, the same amount of people to one of the residents had, had said, um, you know, there is a, a letter today in the Somers record um, ab about this. Hopefully that will raise some more awareness on it. And uh, we'll continue doing everything we can to do to, to uh, help our residents here in Somers. I think one, several years ago I, uh, in another town, an unwanted facility was positioning itself to move into a given residential neighborhood. And the town board was concerned because the only avenue available to us really was litigation. The town board was concerned about putting that much legal effort into one section of the town. And it, it ended up, it did cost a lot of money. But what we found was the rest of the town was supportive of defending that neighborhood mm -hmm. because it came to them in another instance. Yeah. So it became a it, it became a very supportive situation, ultimately successful. But uh, that may turn out to be your own only avenue. So I mean, one other thing is that you know you, we're socializing that maybe we kind of adjust the you know the uh, you know the the ordinances to sort of take this off. That's the, the easy part for art for some for us. And then for us, I mean, as the town board is currently uh, constructed, right? I, mean, I can't speak for everybody. If this came before us right now, I don't think we would <laughs> we would accommodate this. But you want to do this for future, you know, future boards. Um, but you mentioned about an Article 78 and having standing. I mean, again, this is very procedural. So, I mean, it, maybe... pro it probably would be more than an Article 78. It would probably be a de declaratory judgment action. And you would need 
some of the most affected property owners to join as plaintiffs. Right. It couldn't just be the town of Somer. Okay. It couldn't just be. Mm. No, because we don't own the property out there. Oh, I see. So you'd, have need, have you'd, act, you'd need a couple I, of residents. We have to have a standing. And once yeah. once Got one it. party has standing, everyone has standing. Got us. So then the, the town would be the lead, the lead on it, but we'd need to name at least two other I think the, but, I, 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 think, but I think I was like we got to we have that if but essentially better than but it up that come get 200 would that be better than well two? you only need two okay but procedurally that complaint would have to happen after what an approval or can it happen at some point in time it would have to happen after there was an action taken okay okay so it's a short clock yeah Remember that? very short you were right. saying that 30 days from a planning board action right from the filing of that resolution with the town clerk, that's what starts the thirty months. You know, I was I was thinking that that I mean, you hear those people now. These were not unreasonable people who were just screaming about. It. They had legitimate concerns, mm -hmm. um, whether they were emotional or they were scared or just whatever. Scared. But they were talking about the facts of the matter and concerned about things. What about if there's a fire, what blows over? And what about the lithium and where does it go? And how about the water supply that goes into their yards and then would go down the hill and then perhaps the New York City reservoir, which made me think, is the DEP working on this? Yeah. But I think that my, my point is, I think, and they weren't heard. And I guess, I suppose, I understand what Carmel is doing, but I think they should have at least listened. So I would say, let's get uh, a DVD of this and send it to each of the town board and planning board members up there, along with a email that has a link to it. And just out of courtesy and consideration, we hope that you will listen to some of our citizens' concerns, which border your proposed project. You know, we're sending it in the idea of, hey, we've got to work together. You don't know what'll happen, but I you'd have to. Well, it's kind of interesting that they didn't, uh, they did not, the, their board is not lead agency. They've turned it over to their planning board, it seems, right? Yes. I don't, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, typical well, the, we, on a project but, that size, we would probably do. That. But from what I, I Why know, haven't they? limited on, on, on what happened up there in Carmel, it sounds like the building inspector made a determination that. It was a permitted use, and no one appealed that opinion to the zoning board. So that was the first era. That would have had to have been a Carmel resident that could have appealed that to the zoning board. So this could have ended up in an Article 78 sooner had that happened. But again, it's a short fuse. It's either it's usually either 45 or 60 days from the building inspector putting some giving his interpretation and they're past that it's so it do, i don't even know if this ever made a town board agenda because i don't think they amended their zoning code uh, you know kind of said maybe the you know. somebody did some a building inspector determined that it was already a permitted use that's my understanding so this has to procedurally go through the you know the dec the dep well, it would seek or some uh, environmental stuff. so i mean Jeez. we can appeal to those agencies relative to what um, you said there was a model zoning well, we ordinance. How it works. The lead Certain. agency is yeah. when if if they're in a watershed, then D E D E P D E P D E C would be involved. Right. D E P as well, I would. D E P is involved. They're the one to but ask for but, the the D E I S. So that addresses the concerns about I S. Well, they've asked for it. Who so the D E P asked for it? But did the planning board? I don't know if the planning. I have to look back and see if it. So we have to see what the record. If if the planning board there determined to issue a positive declaration and require a DEIS. Was there a scoping session? Uh, d did Dave Smith have access to to the scoping document? Yeah, I mean, if we were to look at their zone- Legitimate questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we were to look at their zoning and we kind of look at the, and we met, let's say we concluded it was a stretch, because this is a big industrial thing going into maybe a light industrial area. I mean, do we have any point of appeal? Uh, do we have any leverage? It's within four months of that. From a decision of the town board, you have a four-month statute of limitations. Oh. And I don't know when that would have occurred. It sounded like that. If that occurred at all, it occurred much earlier. Mm. A lot earlier. Mm. Okay. Mm. So we might just be left with the environment. Before the even notice to the towns. That could have happened actually before the public notice. Yeah. Oh. Before October. 
Yeah. If it happened at all. If it happened at all. Okay. Okay. But just for the record, I mean, we're, this is part, but this is speculation on our part, we're trying to connect dots. That's all. All right. Well, we're limited, but we're not powerless. Yeah, but there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic too. The the inventory of options that we have yeah. and have had is growing, as you guys mentioned. So there's there's some reason for a little optimism. There is. Could we send letters to our representatives to Senator Harcum and Assembly and Slater? Oh yeah, he, uh, he's on this. They were CC'd on 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 this yeah. as well. And so we, uh, I went out to they, with a separate letter to them. Yeah, and a follow up or, phone call. I mean, you know, just say hey, if you didn't see the first one, here's the second yeah. one. Uh, a couple have reached out. Um, have they? They have reached out and they're reviewing the letter. So uh, okay. uh, it's a good sign. Slater, I think, wrote a letter also, oh, right? Uh, I, yeah, I thought, he, Matt's, I thought Matt sort of reiterated to the to the to their board. You know, took a lot of these concepts, but I don't know that Harcum or any of the the uh, I have not legislative to, uh, Senator Harcum or, or the or, uh, county folks. I think one of the comments or a couple comments tonight that were particularly uh, compelling were probably like these things are going to happen if they are in good for the environment and saving energy and be more efficient. But this isn't the place for it, and that's what I heard several well, I think, today. So I don't know anything I about what into the thing argument. is. This is good for the environment overall. Well, I don't know. We'll see. But that was what some of them said, and you know that that could be compelling with our representatives. I mean, essentially, this is a power plant at scale. Is that FERC? I have no idea. Is that is that a federal agency that governs this? Yeah, not crossing state lines. But it's, it's not like the but it's pipe, supply. No, but pipe, supply. But it's not like a pipeline. It's supply. Pipeline was because it goes across. Not, the this isn't like this is not right. This is like supply, though. It's you know battery. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, on that note, uh, make the motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Good night, everyone. Good evening. Good evening.